So good morning. So today we'll begin our continue our discussion on literary criticism and theory. And we want to specifically de- uh, begin by examining why criticism is necessary. We must have hinted at this in our previous class, especially when we said that uh, criticism is inevitable because the nature of human being is to pass judgment on aesthetic objects, part of the nature of human beings. Part of the nature of human beings is to pass judgment on aesthetic objects. And we said that that judgment can be informed or uninformed. So from there we can continue by saying that criticism is necessary. Because it is a way of determining the worth of the literary work. Criticism is necessary because it is a, it's a way of determining the worth of the literary work. Authors would not know whether their works are great if these works are not criticized. There is no way authors will know if their works are great except the work except the works are subjected to critical analysis by seasoned critics. So the greatness or otherwise of the literary work is really determined by the critic. It is in criticism that the great literature <coughs> is in criticism. It is in criticism that great literature is separated from mediocre, mediocre literature. It is in criticism that great literature is separated from mediocre literature. Mediocre literature. Mediocre. To begin with, Critics, especially reviewers, act like middlemen. Critics or reviewers usually act like middlemen who stand between the author and the readers. Critics, usually reviewers, usually stand in between the authors and the readers. They act like middlemen in the sense that they have a way of they have a way of 
telling the author what the readers want to read and letting the readers know whether they should read what the author has written. So that is how critics act like middlemen, standing between the author and the reader. They have a way of telling the author what the readers would like to read, so that the author will know what to write. And they also have a way of informing the reader about the contents of newly published works and letting them decide, giving the information, giving the readers information so that they can decide whether they should read the work or not. So you could see that the job of the critic is a serious one because critics define the test of literature. Critics define the test of good literature at any given period in history. Critics define the test of literature, the test of good literature at any given point in history. Apart from this, books tend to die when they are ignored by critics. Apart from this, books tend to die when they are ignored by critics. Meaning that for a book to be timeless and universal, it has to continually gain the attention of critics across ages. So the worth of a literature, the greatness of a work of art is seen in its ability to constantly gain the attention of the critic, irrespective of the age and time of the work, right? Books tend to die when critics ignore them. Meaning that if a writer is not criticized, or if a writer's work is not criticized, then the work will not be known. Critics are those who popularize works of art. So you could see how serious and how important to see the significance of the critic in any given society. Critics are those who make books popular. And when they ignore books, those books die. So the position of the critic is a very powerful one. And you should want to occupy such a position in, your, in, in, in life. Because critics usually decide which books they should criticize or not, with which books deserve their attention or not. A critic can decide the fate of a writer, no matter how great the writer is. All the critics has to do is to say, I don't want to criticize this book. I don't want to talk about this book. This book is not deserving of my attention. And the writer dies there. And it's, 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 it has recurred, it has been a, a recurrent phenomenon in literary history where books come out at the particular time and critics of the time ignore the book. And the book will not be heard again until maybe later ages when another critic will come up and decide that this book is worthy of attention. So that is the 
um, pride of place, that is how powerful, not necessarily pride of place, that's how powerful critics are. Okay? They determine the worth of literary works. They decide whether the work is going to be popular or not. They decide whether people will read the work or not. All right? So it's a powerful position, and I want most of you to um, occupy that position. All right? Good. So this makes, um, for such a responsibility, for such a responsibility, the critic has to be someone that we can trust. OK? For such a responsibility, the critic has to be someone whose judgment we can trust, OK? Do not trust the critic for any other thing but for his judgment. So the critic is like um, the judge in a literary sphere of life who sits down in court and listens to the the two parties to a case the prosecution and the respondent and at the day end of the day gives his judgment and the judgment has to be Binding because the judge, in his wisdom, has decided the case, and you have to follow because he has looked at the two sides of the case, the two sides, the two um, parties, and the cases they presented, and has also looked at what the law says and then has decided on who's guilty or not. So that is the role of the critic. So the role of the critic can be compared to the role of the judge. He has to look at the book and judge the book by the standards of, by the literary standards of his time. The critic has to look at the book and judge the book by the literary standards of his time. And so the judge, the critic has to look at the book and judge the book by the literary standards of his time. Meaning that the book might be likened to the case, the trial standards to the laws. Trial standards, I mean the, the existing theories, existing aesthetic principles, existing aesthetic principles. What, what, what can we use to measure beauty? What are the rules to use in measuring beauty? These rules are gifted to us by the literary uh, standards of the time. And some of them are drawn by the critics themselves. Some critics actually make the rule, like we said, by proposing theories to be used in interpretation of literature. So then, who should this critic be? Who should this critic be? If his role is so important, if so significant, if he should have wisdom like the judge, then who should 
he be. So the critic should not be any person. Any person should not just wake up from sleep and, and become a critic. Since many people rely on his judgment of a particular work, then we need to examine the qualities of the critic. Right? So the qualities of the literary critic. If you want to be the critic, then you should look out for these qualities and should invite them, should develop them. Number one, the critic should be highly educated in the literary standards of his time. The critic should be highly educated. The critic should be an intelligent person. The critic should, have, should be imbued with natural wisdom, with a sense of judgment. By that we mean that the critic should be intelligent. Because intelligence is not the recollection of facts. Intelligence, rather, is about making the right judgment at the right time. Knowing what to do at a particular time. Taking the right decision at a particular time. Making the right judgment. That is intelligence. Intelligence is not necessarily regurgitating facts. Might just be an aspect of it, but really intelligence is, um, is judgment. The right judgment, making the right judgment. The critic should be imbued with intelligence, should be highly educated. In fact, you must understand that the critic's education never ends. The critic's education never ends. The critic's education, there's no point in the life of a critic that he will say that he has got it all. So the critic is constantly improving himself. Constantly keeping himself abreast with the developments in the field. So the critic's education never ends. The critic should be a voracious reader. The critic should be a voracious reader. The critic should be a voracious reader. Precious reader is one who loves reading and is never tired of reading. He is always hungry for books. I was looking for books to read. That is the version of it. I know we have versions of that in the house. So by being a voracious reader, the critic is not limited to certain texts or material. The critic reads across board. The critic reads anything and everything. The critic does not select the materials that he reads. Critic does not select the material that he reads. He reads everything because he needs that cultural knowledge. Somebody who is in the sphere of cultural studies does not select material, does not say, This is my field. 
all right? You must know something about science. You must know something about art. You must know something about economics. You must know something about aviation. You must know something about agriculture. That is the critic that we are talking about. That is the ideal critic. Does not select. Does not say when it comes to when it comes to chemistry. That's not my area. I'm not going to read that because he needs to know something about chemistry. Since all of these fields are distilled in literature, they have that melting point in literature. So the critic has to be versatile. The critic has to be versatile. Critic has to be versatile. If you are going to be a critic, you are going to occupy this important position. You must know of what is required of you. Because every important position you must understand goes with some responsibility. So you must be versatile. You should be able to say something about any field of human endeavor. So your knowledge has to be wide as a critic. You need to widen your horizon. You need to know a lot around life, around cultures. You should know history, you know politics. As much as you can. <clears throat> The critic must be objective. The critic must be objective. This quality is very important. The critic has to be objective. Balance in judgment signals objectivity not being biased or prejudiced signals objectivity when the critic puts on his gaps the when the critic puts on his gaps or when the critic puts on his hat He knows neither friends nor foes. Right? He knows neither friends nor foes. So the critic is not the person who says something favorable about the work because the work belongs to a friend. And when it's the work of an enemy, the critic will find ways to criticize it. We don't need such people as critics. The critic has to be objective. Not biased. But say the thing as it is. So the critic has to be honest. The critic has to be honest. Tell the truth. If the work is good, you say so. If the work is bad, you say so. Of course, as I said from the beginning, Works are not completely good, nor completely bad. So you need to strike a balance somewhere, which is also the mark of object, object, objectivity in the critic. Right? So the critic should not include facts that are not found in the text. Should not force facts into the text. That is not honest. That is dishonest criticism. That is dishonest criticism. So this means that the critic has to be diligent. Critic has to be diligent in his work. So as to deliver something that will benefit to the audience.
The critic has to keep records. The critic must keep records. The critic checks down notes and keeps records of what he has done. Part of the honesty of the critic is that you must acknowledge the work of others if you have drawn from them. Part of the honesty of the critic is that you must acknowledge the works of others if you have drawn from them, if you have taken information from them. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong in saying, according to Peter, and then you quote Peter or even paraphrase that portion of the text. And, but acknowledge the person who said it, or who had that idea. That scholarship. Instead of lifting the whole paper, and then place it, and then you call it your own, and it's a seminar paper and you want to submit. So if you are going to be a critic of literature, you need to learn how to acknowledge the work of others, where you have drawn from them. How you proceed is that when you pick a material, you have to take down the important information about that material. For instance, the title of the material, the name of the author, the year of publication, the place of publication, and the publishers, and the number and the, and the pages where you draw information from. Because if you take a particular quote from page two at the end, add the page two. And you remember that these are the important information that you need when citing these sources. So you have to take down notes. And then you have to read the material and understand the material and report in your own words. This is where you read a paper once or twice without knowing what that paper means and you can even talk about it in one paragraph. This is what this paper says. And if you have to take some quotes to justify your explanations, no problem. Just acknowledge that in quotation marks that this quote was taken from that paper. You acknowledge the source. That's scholarship. So you must start now and learn these things. So that you don't have a problem when it's your time to write. All right, so we proceed. So the critic is expected to read a work of literature, a work of art, or study a work of art, because I've already said that aesthetic objects are many. They are not only books, all right? Aesthetic objects are works of art, works that have beauty in them. Like a painting, like a sculptor, a sculpture, right? Drawing, carving, monuments. Anything that inspires beauty is a work of art. Movies. A dance station. Poetry recitation. Performances. These are aesthetic objects. 
because they are saying in terms of that these courses. Even a political rally can be analyzed as, an, as a work of art. Because it's an event contains a story. But it has a plot. It has a beginning and an end. It is structured. And so can be taken apart to be understood. So we have what we call reading with the grain. Remember that reading itself is, is an act of criticism or interpretation. Reading with the grain. So, so if somebody says a reading of you know, at your best, things fall apart. This principle means, what the, what the principle means is a criticism, an interpretation of things fall apart. Because to read is to criticize, is to interpret, is to evaluate, to try to make sense of. So reading with the brain, refers to an interpretation that flows with the world's conventional meaning. Okay, our forms of reading now. We're talking about reading with the grain and reading against the grain. Then with the grain and reading against the grain. So we said that reading with the grain refers to what? An interpretation that flows with the work's conventional meaning. An interpretation that flows with the work's conventional meaning. That means this type of reading does not destabilize the traditional meaning of the work, does not act against the traditional meaning of the work. That means whatever the author must, must have meant while reading the work is retained as the meaning of the work when the critic is reading with the grain. All right? So when an interpretation aligns, when an interpretation aligns with the conventional meaning of the work, we are talking about reading with the grain. Right? And then we have reading against the grain. Reading against the grain. Reading against the grain is a deconstructive reading. Reading against the grain is a deconstructive reading. Because it destabilizes the conventional meaning of the work. Because it destabilizes the conventional meaning of the work. In this type of reading, the, the critic wants to show us other ways that the work could mean apart from the conventional meaning. It might even be opposite of what the work means conventional meaning of the work. We will say, you people have been saying this work in this way, but I'm going to tell you that this is, this, this is what this work actually means, and it's not what you have been saying. So that's what we mean by reading against the grain, the constructive. Okay? I actually give an example of um, reading against the grain using um, the paper I co-authored with now, I'm Professor Ima Emmanuel. You know you? The part is entitled The Example of a Hero. The Constructive Reading of Eugene. 
Achike, which my man that which is people are discuss. It's on um, it's online, you Google, online you can download PDF to your phone and read. The example of a hero. The constructive reading of Eugene in Chimamanda Beaches Purple Hibiscus. In that paper, we argue that, in that paper, we argue that this is the beauty of the teacher, right? This is what makes the teacher. Um, so interesting and exciting because you can read a text and come away with your own meaning, particularly a meaning that challenges the conventional meaning. And if you have your facts and your points correct, you will be able to convince your reader still. Okay? In literature, not everyone has to be, agree with you, but if you can present your facts convincingly with points to back them up, then the reading stands. So you might want to read that paper and see what we said because we argue in that paper that we argue in that paper that it is Eugene who is the hero of people at this course, not Camden. The conventional reading of people at this course is that Camden is the heroine, right? But in our paper, we argue that this is not so. Exactly, Eugene is the hero. And that Eugene is not a bad person. That's what it is, that Eugene is a good guy. Right? Okay, so if you don't believe, you have to read the paper and then see whether you will not be convinced at the end of the day when you see our argument. All right, so that's reading against the grain. And um, reading against the grain is really quite challenging but exciting, you can carry it out. It should be noted, and take a paragraph, we have not taken a paragraph since we started, like since last class, we not taken a paragraph. And since the beginning of this class, we not taken a paragraph. You can take one now, right? Take a, take a break. The relationship between the reader and the text, the relationship between the reader and the text is transactional. The relationship between the reader and the text is transactional. That is, the reader uses his or her past knowledge and experiences to navigate the events in the text in order to create meaning. The relationship between the reader and the text is transactional. The reader does not come to the text with nothing. If I say the reader does not come to the text with nothing. Good. So, when the text and the reader meet, they exchange something. Something um, passes between them. Okay? They affect each other. The relationship between the reader and the text is transactional in the sense that the reader uses his or her past knowledge and experiences. And that includes how many books you've read before in your life. Okay? That will help you understand this from that. That's why some people read some things that the students don't understand. You have to understand with them. Okay? In that lack of understanding. Because they may not have been prepared to understand the book. So, uses his or past knowledge and experience to navigate the events in the text in order to create meaning. So we might not always have the same level of understanding of the text because of this transactionality of the text, between the text and the reader. This transactionality that exists between the text and the reader. Okay, that's why some people will read and then say, I don't understand. I don't know. Okay, and you wonder, why don't they understand? 
probably they don't have the enough experience, they are not really enough in the past to be able to tackle that particular check at that point of time. What does that mean? You start reading now. You know, start having experiences now. Psychological experiences, intellectual experiences. You have to expose your brain. Because the more exposure your brain has with books, the more um, the, the maturity, okay? And the sooner the maturity of the brain, okay? So I will just give you another instance. If we have to criticize a particular poem and bring out the figurative devices in the poem, the critic will only be able to bring as many, bring out as many figurative devices in the poem as he or she knows. You know two, you only recognize two. Similarly, I better for. <laughs> <laughs> so no matter, no matter how many times he or she will read the text, she will only see similarly and better for. That's all. Okay? And so the understanding of that critic will be limited. We'll not be able to explore the beauty of the text because this knowledge is limited. But the critic that has vast knowledge, vast repertoire of literary devices will be able to harvest them. And, and he will have a richer, more meaningful criticism than the other critic. All right? So with that knowledge, with that example, nobody should tell you to start widening the horizon of your mind. Okay? Through excessive and extensive reading because you bring your past experiences to bear your maturity your mental maturity to bear the interpretation that you like. that's all there's no other way okay we've talked about theory now let's look at meta theory the concept of the meta theory. The meta theory can be defined. Meta theory can be defined as an overaching literary theory Meta theory can be defined as an overaching literary theory that encompasses all possible interpretations of a text suggested to it, suggested to it by readers, or suggested by, read, by its readers. <coughs> a meta theory is an overarching literary theory that encompasses all possible interpretations of a text suggested by its readers. Full stop. Take it again, perhaps for the last time. A meta theory can be defined as an overaching literary theory that encompasses all the possible interpretations of a text suggested by its readers. By its readers. And the question that we need to ask at this point is, is there such a theory? Is there a meta theory? 
that one theory that can account for all the possible interpretations of the text. Is there a meta theory? Is that a yes or no? Is there a meta theory? No, yes. Alright, so the answer is that there is no meta theory. There is no meta theory. Overlapping literary theories. We have overlapping literary theories. Theories that have overlaps in the tenets and principles and which can be grouped into schools of criticism. Whether we have overlapping literary theories, that would mean theories that have overlaps in their tenets or principles, and which can help us group them into what? Schools of criticism. Because they have the, these theories tend to have similar tenets, overlapping tenets, okay? For instance, theories like Marxism, postcolonialism, tend to have similar tenets. They tend to align. But theories like formalism, structuralism, tend to have some in that in it, and they will, they will be opposing theories like Marxism and postcolonialism. So you cannot put formalism and postcolonialism in one school, right? You can only place theories in schools based on their similarities, based on the similarities in their tenets. And even when you're talking about literary approaches, the approaches have to be similar. They have to have the same um, tenets. So, school of criticism, school of criticism, refers to a group of theories, refers to a group of theories that are based on similar large scale assumption. Schools of criticism refers to a group of theories that are based on similar large scale assumptions. So we have talked so far about theory and criticism, which are the principles used to interpret literature. It is time for also to understand literature, which is the object of art. And we'll begin with the definition of literature. Because you need to know what literature is in order to know how to approach it, interpret it.
So the word literature has a Latin root. Litera. Which means letter. This implies that literature. This implies that literature is written and therefore anything that is written down can be called literature. And therefore anything that is written down can be called literature. The view of literature as written is faulty and defective at two points. The view of literature as written is faulty or defective at two points. because it is the arrogance of the modern Western criticism that defines literature as written. It is the arrogance of the modern Western critic that causes literature to be defined as what? Well, written. So the first problem with the definition of literature as written is that it ignores the existence of oral literature. It ignores the existence of oral literature. <laughs> it ignores oral literature and pretends that oral literature is not deserving to be called literature. That's the first problem, the definition of literature as anything that is written down. The second problem with this definition is that the scope is too wide because it accommodates all written texts as literature. Now, this will not be wrong except that it is confusing and does not specifically um, state or identify that works of imagination are literature. Rather, anything that is written down, whether it is economics, Newspaper publication, mathematics textbook will be literature. True, we have these literatures. Okay? For instance, if someone asks you, do you have? the literature of accounting. The person asked me if you have what has been written down in accounting. But the literature that we are talking about here is different and should be understood and specified as different because it is based on what? Creativity and imagination. The literature that we are talking about is based on what? Creativity and imagination. That is what literature means to us. 
in this course. There has to be, for a work to be qualified as literature, worthy of critical attention, the work has to have what? Creativity and imagination. It has to be an aesthetic object. It has to have a story told structurally, organized in such a way as to please, entertain, teach, inspire. and move. Okay, so at this point we can differentiate between the literature of knowledge and the literature of power. This one, at this point we can differentiate between the literature of knowledge and the literature of power. The literature of knowledge and the literature of power. What is the difference between the literature of knowledge and the literature of power? The difference is that the literature of knowledge aims to provide information, basically. To teach, basically. And that is what you find in economic textbooks, in mathematics textbooks. They give facts. That's literature of knowledge. But literature of power is imaginative literature. Literature of power is imaginative literature. It's creative. And literature of power moves. Literature of power moves. Literature of power empowers. Literature of power empowers. Literature of power inspires. Literature of power inspires. Moves, empowers, inspires. It has the ability to get hold of the soul. It has the ability to challenge stereotypes. It has the ability to change mindsets. It has the ability to transform. This is creative and imaginative literature. That is ability to create amazement in the human soul. And ultimately, literature of power can make people take action. Your power can make people take action to seek to change.
So to solve the problem, notice in the definition of literature as written, we need to see literature as art. Just what? Art. When you see literature as art, when you see literature as art, when you see literature as art, then it will imply that literature can be anything that has aesthetics. So I always tell students, when you get to our final year, you want to do your project, you can always, if, if, if you don't like this um, large voluminous novels that you're reading, you can always look to something else. We have videos, we have movies, okay? You can do what you love, dance videos, right? Now, one of the past sets I, I have supervised the students who did something on dance um, videos. And it succeeded. I was I, I supervised students who did something on movies. So you can do your, your, what you love as far as, far as those things are. Those things have aesthetics. You don't have to die with the novels. <laughs> All right? You have to um, slum and faint on top of novels or poetry. <clears throat> so if, even if you don't like the poetry that is um, written, you can do the one that is recited. Okay, take some um, recited um, poems, spoken word poems, and then analyze them as discourses. Okay, because this field of literature is so beautiful, so wide, and welcomes everyone. Whatever your interest is, you'll find it here, right? In literature. And so it doesn't have to be boring. So when we see literature as art, it solves the problem. It solves the problem. of ignoring oral literature, which is performance. So emphasis in a definition of literature should be anything that has imagination and creativity in it, anything that has aesthetics. Aesthetics means beauty. Beauty that can be appreciated. Somebody dances and you say, wow, that dance is structured and can be analyzed as a literary work. Right? But that's beauty. So we can define literature, can define literature as a structured work of art that endures the ravages of time. And the fine literature as a structured work of art that endures the ravages of time. By this, we mean that anything that literature should be relevant for all time and for all ages especially in terms of the themes contained in them. Anybody, whether in, um, in the past, or in the present, or in the future, should pick up the text and read and still enjoy it as literature. Because it contains timeless and universal themes, ideas, issues. Okay? Like love, like jealousy, like hatred, and okay? patience, endurance, generosity, selfishness. Literature is a structured work of art that mirrors the author's primary world. 
literature is a structured work of art that mirrors the author's primary world. Literature is a structured work of art. Structured means that it has operating principles, it has rules, right? It is highly organized. It is, it is crafted, that's what I mean by structure. It is built. It is not, it's not um, produced by chance. Okay? Somebody sat down, planned its existence, and step by step brings it to reality. That's why I say it is structured. Literature is a structured work of art that mirrors the author's primary world. Literature is determined by its value. Literature is determined by its value. And the value of literature is seen in its ability to capture the human imagination and hold it for a considerable length of time. It mesmerizes, makes you wonder. <clears throat> so those works that you open and you cannot stop reading till you get to the end, those are great literature because it arrests you, and hooks you, and commands you to read and finish it. That's his literature. Another value of literature is that it is capable of entertaining that suspense. leaves you thinking long after you've read it. You cannot forget some of the characters in a hurry. You think about them sometimes. So literature is an aesthetic object. Because it, because it has beauty. The beauty is usually manifested in the use of language, the command of language. Through the device of defamiliarization, through the device of defamiliarization, through the device of defamiliarization. Which is the art of, which is the art of making ordinary events look extraordinary. And that, that is describing ordinary everyday experiences as extraordinary. Which is the art of describing everyday ordinary events in extraordinary ways. The art of describing Every day, 
ordinary events in an extraordinary way. That is the familiarization. So the art object, excuse <coughs> me, has its inbuilt or inherent beauty, which is located in the use of language. The art object has its inbuilt or inherent beauty, located in the use of language. The organization of events The, the mixing of the colors, the juxtaposition of sounds and sights and videos. Both Plato and Aristotle believe that the artwork has inherent beauty. Both Aristotle and Plato believe that the artwork has inherent beauty. This beauty is formal. That this beauty is formal. Which can be appreciated in the same way by everyone can be appreciated in the same way by everyone. It can be appreciated in the same way by everyone. Someone like David Hume Someone like David Hume believed that Beauty is relative. Which is what? Relative. And that it is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Meaning that. Meaning that two persons cannot see the same beauty in a work of art. While one might see beauty, the other one might see something different. note is that literature is that which narrates the human story. Literature is that which narrates the human story. You cannot divorce story from literature. You cannot divorce story from literature. Literature is story and it is the human story. Any, of, any aesthetic object can tell a story. Eh? Because if you see a drawing, that drawing, there's a story behind it. And if you study well, you know the story. You can put back the story. You can bring out the story in the object. You don't have to be a storybook. 
any art object has a story that it tells. And you, as the critic, can bring out the story in the art object. So we'll now move on to literary history, essays, critics, and critics. Literary history, essays, critics, sorry, essays, critics, and critics. Critics and critics. We'll begin with Plato and Aristotle. We'll begin with Plato and Aristotle. While Plato believed that the work of literature was Fiction. Why Plato believed that literature was fiction? Aristotle believed that literature was that which imitated reality. Literature was that which imitated reality. Both of them began what is known as mimetic criticism. Both of them began what is known as mimetic criticism. A type of criticism which views literature as that which copies from reality. Except that, except that for Plato, said that for Plato, literature. was far away from reality, was two steps removed from reality, which was two steps removed from reality. Since the poet copied from the world of sense experience, the material world, which Plato saw as a fake, because the original world was spiritual. For Plato, the original world was a spiritual world. The world of sense experience or the material world existed because the original form was in the spiritual world. So the material world was not the original world. But the poet copies from the material world, which makes his work to be double faith, two steps removed from reality. Remember, remember that for these ancient critics, these mimetic critics, 
Reality is synonymous with the truth. Reality means truth. What is real is what is true. So they were searching for the truth. <clears throat> that search for reality means that they were searching for truth. And for Plato, the true world was spiritual. So Aristotle disagreed with Plato and rather stated that since the spiritual world cannot be discernible to the to the sense experience that the sense the world of sense experience or the material world should be taken as the original world. That would mean that the poet is imitating the original world. That would then mean that the poet is imitating the original world and not a fake. Plato's ideas on literature are contained <coughs> in the Republic, while, while Aristotle's ideas on literature are contained in the Poetics. Are contained in the Poetics. <coughs> so it should be understood that There have been various ways of looking at limited criticism down the ages, but that it began with Plato and Aristotle. Till today, we are still looking at how, in what ways, works of literature should interact with the real world. Right? It got to a point when some people said that it should be art for art's sake. Shots pay attention to the language, forget about the historical world. But literature is about telling the human story, basically. And so it cannot be divorced from what is going on in our real world. Literature has to take a stand, the poet has to take a stand politically and otherwise. Okay? So we continue to have this argument, this quarrel, this fight. But of course, that's the beauty of literary criticism. We don't always have to agree. Right? That's what makes them feel excited, interesting. Now we have to agree. So people say, in a world full of social ills, why should literature retreat into itself? Literature should come out. Because literature has power to empower the people to change their circumstances. So literature should interact with the world. Okay? Except that at the level of criticism, you have to be systematic and organized. You have to be imaginative, even in your criticism. And the way we should do it is, when you mention a particular issue, you simply take the portion of the text that talks about that issue and discuss it. And not necessarily telling the story all over again. Just cite the relevant portions of the text. The theme of hunger. The theme of hunger is seen in this character who uh, was hungry for three days. Without, um, and then you, you state the theme of war. 
there's war in the novel between this village and this village. Simple. All right. So, after, after Plato and Aristotle, we had Horace. His full name is Quintus. Or simply known as Horace. He lived between 65 to 8 BC. Right? He lived between 65 to 8 BC. Was a Roman poet and satirist. Have you ever heard of the Horatian satire? So this is the guy. Was a, was a Roman poet and satirist. His ideas on literature are contained in an essay entitled, of course, when we have more groups, We'll, I, I will assign more essays. I will try essays that you can also do meta criticism on. There are so many. But we have to take these ones. But when it gets to the modern period, the essays are just so mirrors. Right? So you need to know the essays. Part of knowing uh, criticism is to know the important essays. Okay? Hmm? Because you don't, you, don't, you, don't need, you don't need a meta theory to do uh, meta criticism. They are different. Meta criticism is um, not an all encompassing criticism of the work. It is to it simply means to criticize that which has criticized another person. Meta criticism is the criticism of an existing criticism. Hmm. But in meta theory, we hope that it might exist someday, but it's not possible. It's a theory that presents itself as being able to account for all the tenets. Okay? Used in the interpretation of a work of art. But because we don't have similar tenets, some tenets are completely opposite. So you cannot have a meta theory. That's the problem. So um, Horace, Horace's um, essay on literature is entitled "As Poetica." Or in English, the art of poetry. Or in English, the art of poetry. English, the art of poetry. Some of the important ideas in that essay are one that poets should imitate other poets. Poets should imitate other poets. That is, 
we should Im imitate great poets. He urged the Roman poets of the time to imitate Greek poets, the great Greek poets, because they were the best. Poets should imitate other poets, not just any poet, but great poets of the Greek era, like Homer. He also said that critics should First of all, learn the standards of literature of their time. The education of the critic is very important to Horace. Critics must, first of all, learn the, the standards of the literature of their time. He goes on to prescribe for for writers, he goes on to prescribe for writers. That means he presents some do's and don'ts for the writer. Presents some do's and don'ts for the writer. For instance, he says that writers should write about traditional subjects in unique ways. The writer should write about traditional subjects in unique ways. The writer should write about traditional subjects in unique ways. That means um, themes that people already know are familiar with. You write in such a way that it looks fresh to them. It's beautiful to them. It excites them. Okay? Because Literature always focuses on human beings and the human story, and it's, it's the same thing all through, but how these things are crafted in a story by different writers is what makes them unique. The way this particular writer treats the theme of love will not be the same uh, with another writer. He advocates moderation. He advocates moderation. He advocates moderation. Writers should have avoid the extremes, especially in 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 theme, in diction as choice of words, in subject matter and in style. Writers should do what follow the path of moderation. They should not go the extreme way in the depiction of character, the use of language, the depiction of subject matter and style of the work. He uses this term which is Latin, say, util, which is Latin for sweet and useful to describe what the best literature should look like, what the ideal literature should look like. Be sweet and useful. It just should be sweet and useful. Which is why we constantly say that the function, the primary function of literature is to entertain. And useful should teach, should educate, should learn something after reading a text. Either for morality or even for knowledge. So the best literature is that which teaches and delights. The best literature teaches and delights. The best literature teaches and delights. The best literature at once teaches and delights. The best literature at once 
stitches and what? Lines. We move on to longines. Long long so while Plato and Aristotle represented the Greek classical period, and um, Horace represents the Roman period, Roman classical period. And we are talking about Longinus now. He lived in the first century AD. He lived in the first century AD. <coughs> Longinus lived in the first century AD. His major work on literary criticism is entitled On the Sublime. It's titled On the Sublime. On the Sublime. On the Sublime. He is said to be the first, is said to be the first comparative critic. He is said to be the first comparative critic. Comparative criticism is a type of criticism that draws from different regions and traditions. That draws from different literary traditions and regions. For instance, a comparative critic can combine an African work with a European work. A comparative, comparative critic can combine a literary work uh, from, uh, from Africa and a literary work from America in order to see the similarities in the experiences in the two places, the themes, the language and so on, that's a comparative critic. Or even the differences. So we are saying that, um, and of course, comparative criticism is very important today. You can establish connections between Africa and Europe, Africa and Asia, all of that will be um, a very important critic. So he's the first comparative critic because of the combining of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin quotations in his work. Because of the combination of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin quotations in his work. He said to be the first comparative critic because <clears throat> he is, because he combined Hebrew, Greek and Latin quotation in his work. He said that criti critics should concentrate on a single element of a text. Critics should concentrate on a single element of a text. He also said that critics should be well read. Critics should be well read. If you don't read wide, you cannot be a good critic. Critics should be well read. It is a well read critic that will be able to determine which work is great. And which work is mediocre? <clears throat> it is a well read critic that will determine which work is great and which work is mediocre because he has vast literary tests, right? He has tested many literary works and so will know which one is good and which one is not. He will have the knowledge. So, um, Longinus believe in the greatness of literary work. And the work of art has to be great. 
And what determines that, that it is this gradient that it means that it calls the sublime. This gradient that it means that it calls the sublime. There's a, the element in the sublime that makes it last forever, will never fade. So a great work of art is one that will never die, one that can never fade, one that will continue to be useful throughout time. So the sublime, or the greatness of a literary work, is determined by its timelessness. So that after many years, since the publication of the work, many years after, the work is still being studied. Right? Years after the publication of the work, it is still being studied. Okay? That's a greatness in try work. It bears repeated examination. The work bears repeated examination. So you can look at, you can attest to the existence of such works, even as we speak. We move on to the next right, the next um, critic, which is Dante Alighieri. Dante. Dante Alighieri. Dante Alighieri. He lived between 1265, 1265 AD to 1321 AD. Lived between 1265 to 1321 AD. This is the medieval period in Europe. This is the what? Medieval, medieval period. So, Dante Alighieri was um, a major critic of the medi medieval period. A major critic of the medieval period. The major critic of the medieval period. He was born in the city of Florence, <clears throat> in Italy, during the Middle Ages. He was born in Florence, Italy, during the Middle Ages. He was banished from Florence for political reasons and wrote most of his works while in exile. Was banished from Florence for political reasons and wrote most of his works while in exile. Was banished from Fl Florence for political reasons and wrote most of his works while in exile. He's best known for his work <coughs> entitled Divine Comedy. He's best known for his work entitled Divine Comedy. The essay, or the work that contains his idea on literary criticism, the essay, or his work that contains his ideas of literary criticism, is entitled Letter to Kind Grand and Villa Scar. Letter to Kind Grand Villa
in this work, in this work, in this work, Dante is interested in the proper use of language in writing poetry. <clears throat> poetry could mean literature generally. He's interested in the proper use of language for poetry. He advocates the use of the vernacular. <coughs> Excuse me. He advocates the use of the vulgar tongue. Or the vernacular. As an appropriate and beautiful language for poetry. Remember that at this time, Chaucer, in English uh, literature, has also um, proposed the use of the vernacular to write literature. And this was at a time when, when Latin and Greek were um, respected languages, and there were foreign languages in England. So Dante, said that the proper language of poetry should be what? The vernacular. Now that gives, that gives that Dante bequeath literary criticism is, is symbolic meaning. Symbolic meaning. Symbolic meaning. Or what we might call allegorical meaning. Allegorical meaning. Before now, allegorical meaning was used in the interpretation of the scriptures, the Bible. But Dante advocates that it can be used in literature. So Dante introduced allegorical meaning to literature. And by allegorical meaning, we mean layers of meaning in a work of art. The presence of layers of meaning in a work of art the surface meaning and the deeper meaning. Okay, so we'll stop there for today. We take a break and then we we'll resume the next class. Just some five minutes break.